Ladies and gentlemen, I am Tosh Berman and this is another episode of Tosh Talks where I give a talk, of course. Subject matter for today's talk is a subject matter that I have discussed before on Tosh Talks, but I always have this compelling need to continue talking about this artist, this individual, this eccentricity that uh, has been with my life for now over mm, like 28 years. It's by the name of Joe Meek. And I think most of you who watch my show or know my world know who Joe Meek is, but for those who don't, Joe Meek was a record producer and engineer from the mid late 1950s to his death in 1967. He's British, he's London based, he's basically lived his whole adult life in North London, in the Islington part of uh, London. And uh, he, his main studio, which he recorded a lot of his, his records, were all done in his home, his flat in Holloway Road in North London. And what's interesting about Joe Meek is that he's probably the first DIY record producer or one of the first independent producers. You got to keep in mind at that time in the 50s and the early 60s, people like in Joe Meek's profession who are engineers work for bigger companies like EMI or, or, uh, or uh, DECA Records. And at the time, all the engineers had to wear a white lab coats. So it was a very strict dress uniform they have to wear when they're working on recordings. And Joe Meek came through that world. He's one of those guys who had to wear a white lab coat. And the thing that separates Joe Meek from other engineers of that time, uh, recording engineers, was that Meek was quite temperamental and quite egotistical. He had his own version of what a sound is and how it should be made. And Joe Meek eventually was either asked to leave his occupation or he chose to leave to be independent. And he built his own home studio, at least in two homes. He, built, uh, he, had a, he had a flat apartment and then eventually later he moved to Holloway Road, uh, which is a huge street in London. And he lived upstairs in his flat, which he made into a recording studio, as well as the previous apartment. And you have to keep in mind that Joe Meek did not go to work from his home to work. He lived at his work. He, his bedroom, as well as every room in his apartment, was the recording studio. So he never had a separation of private life and work life. It's all the same to Joe Meek. And I first discovered Joe Meek when I was living in Japan in 89, 1989. And, um, I, I talked about the group, The Honeycombs, which is a band I was obsessed with and still obsessed with. And I talked about that in Tosh Talks, in the previous Tosh Talks. But for The Honeycombs, who Joe Meek produced, I discovered other Joe Meek recording. Basically, when I went to a record store called The Wave in Japan, they had a, a Joe Meek compilation double CD set. It came out of England, but it was sold in Japan. And I purchased it just due to my loyalty to the honeycombs. I really didn't know anything about Joe Meek at the time. So when I purchased the, um, the Meek compilation, um, I was struck about the sounds I heard in the honeycombs, but they actually went even beyond that. Joe Meek is very much, though extremely commercial minded, or at least in his mind, he was commercially minded. He's a totally experimental artist. Um, and as a man who produced and engineered a series of musicians who all, had to, who all had to come to his studio, his home, to make these records, and that means like making records in the bathroom, in the kitchen, in the living room, in his bedroom, and on the staircase outside that led from the first floor to the second floor. Joe Meek used everything in his house as a, as a studio. And there's no separation, as I mentioned, no separation from his work and from his home life. Um, another thing that 
made me interested in Joe Meek on another level was his homosexuality. Now, not him being gay itself is interesting at all. I mean, that's not the interesting aspect. What's interesting is he was a homosexual, gay, in a time in London, England, where gay sexuality was basically outlawed. You're not, it was against the law to be gay, meaning you cannot have gay sex. If you had gay sex, you could be arrested for that. So a lot of these people had to be either, as they say, live in a closet and pretend they're not gay, or there's total outcast sorts. Um, what I've read about and heard about Joe Meek was that he was obviously gay and had a very strong sexual needs in a manner. So many of the musicians that he chose or people he worked with is not only because of their musical talents, but also due to what he called their trousers. He had an obsession about men's trousers and the men inside who wear the trousers. And um, this sometimes caused him problems, sometimes it did not cause him problems. But obviously he has chose singers who could not sing a note, but on the other hand they look pretty good. They're very handsome. So there is that aspect of Joe Meek's world where he chose artists, musicians who look very good to his eyes and perhaps return a certain sexual flavor or a relationship of some sort, as well as some of the musicians being very talented. Nevertheless, Meek started his own independent label, his own independent service, and started making his own recordings where he wrote a lot of the songs, or he had another songwriter by the name of Goddard who uh, worked for Joe Meek and wrote songs for Joe Meek, as well as did some arrangements for Joe Meek's rec recordings. And this last three weeks, I've been purchasing Joe Meek oriented records lately. And I'm just going to show some of them to you. One is Screaming Lord Such. This is called the Screaming Lord Such Story. It's a compilation of all the early Joe Meek recordings with uh, Screaming Lord Such. And Screaming Lord Such, that's him right here, as well as him right here, is a very interesting figure. Um, he, um, he's been around for a long time. He died, in 19, he died in the late 90s by suicide. I believe he hung himself. But before then, Screaming Lord Such was a rock and roll figure uh, in England who uh, took the identity of a horror monster. In a way, he's like the prototype of Alice Cooper, who also adopted a horror identity for their work and made some horrific pop songs. Uh, the difference between Alice Cooper, who was American, and I'm speaking as the band, as well as the individual Alice Cooper, and Screaming Lord Such, besides him being British and one is American, is that Alice Cooper, I think, is more intellectual than uh, Screaming Lord Such. Screaming Lord Such was his band, The Savages, who dressed like cavemen, like the Flintstones, while he dressed in a sort of ghoulish white makeup and a top hat horror thing. Um, had songs called like Jack the Ripper, and uh, she's fallen in love with the monster man of another big over him. And then, of course, the beautiful Dracula's daughter, another great Screaming Lord Such song. So there's two sides of Screaming Lord Such. There are the horror songs, which is devoted to the, uh, to the, to the horror monsters that, that Lord Such admired greatly, as well as the rock and roll 1950s songs. He did, he did like Little Richard cover, and he did a cover of the, of the Burnett Brothers, um, The Train Kept a Rowing. And the Joe Meek, Lord, Screaming Lord Such, relationship is very interesting. It's, um, um, as I mentioned, Screaming Lord Such was very much into horror, and He's, and, but also, Screaming Lord Such is very much part of a, of, a, of a music hall tradition or sort of the theater tradition of like these B, like B movies. There's also like B theater type of um, productions where they do like horror, horror stories. And there's a guy named Todd Slaughter 
who was a horror actor and a director, but he also had a traveling um, theater group troupe that traveled throughout Great Britain, and they would do these horrific reenactments of murders, crime, stabbings for the stage, for the audience. Very low-level theater stuff. But Screaming Lord, such, in a way, comes from that tradition of music hall, British variety, horror stuff. And uh, meeting Joe Meek is, is actually a natural thing, because Joe Meek himself had an interest, I wouldn't say into horror, but he had an interest in flying saucers, UFOs, and the afterlife. He believed in, he actually did a lot of seances throughout his adult life where he contacted the dead. One of his best friends after he died apparently was Buddy Holly. Buddy Holly came to Joe Meek numerous times during a seance. Or that's what Joe Meek believed. Anyway, um, Screaming Lord Such made these novelty horror songs which allowed Joe Meek go full throttle on sound effects, meaning screams of women screaming and stabbing sounds and, and you know, mad laughter and, and this sort of this, this mayhem horrorness that Joe Meek's whimmed into the sea of, 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 of this B-movie sort of mythology and imagery. So Screaming Lord Such is like a good example of these early recordings of, of, of him working with Joe Meek and capturing that period of time was Meek at his most, when he's most experimenting with sound effects of all sorts. And I'll get into the sound effects a little bit later, but Screaming Lord Such story is a really a fascinating record. If you can find it, hard to find, but if you find it, it's worthy of it. Um, the other record that I'm fond of, and this is going back to sort of the homosexual aspect of uh, Joe Meek's world, is Heinz, platinum blonde bass player for the Tornados. At first, I thought Heinz could not sing really well, but he had a look. And Joe Meek took him on as an artist, as, with, as the bass player of the Tornados, which he produced, of course. He did Tell Star Within, which was a huge hit, probably Joe Meek's biggest hit, besides Have I the Right by the Honeycombs. And uh, Heinz is an interesting figure himself. He's, he's a, he was the bass player for the Tornados, and Meek convinced him to have a solo career. And he made a series of solo recordings under Joe Meek's direction. Most of the songs were written either by Goddard or Joe Meek, and um, and it's based on 50s Buddy Holly type of rock and roll. By no means as good as Buddy Holly, because I want to make this very clear. Buddy Holly is a genius. Recording genius, songwriting genius. Joe Meek is a genius as well, but in a very different, different planet from Buddy Holly. Though Meek loved Buddy Holly and loved all the Buddy Holly's techniques, Joe Meek took those techniques and that aesthetic into another planet altogether. And Heinz is part of that other planet. And, I do, and the reason I do mention because of the, of the homosexual aspect of this, um, Heinz claims he never had a homosexual relationship with Joe Meek, nor had any that type of personal relationship with Joe Meek. On the other hand, Heinz did move in with Joe Meek for seven years in his uh, Holloway apartment. Um, very, I, I don't think there's any guest rooms in the hallway ap apartment, including the recording studio. Everything is recorded. So the Heinz records, are, I, re I do recommend. They're not like masterpieces in themselves, but it's a good snapshot of the Joe Meek world, and it's a very enjoyable music. Now we're getting to the genius part. Here's the one album that Joe Meek I would say, could express his full genius. I Hear a New World, a Outer Space Music Fantasy by Joe Meek featuring the Blue Men. And this album is remarkable. It's a very early Joe Meek recording compared to his other recordings. He recorded it in 1959, and part of the record was released as an EP in 1960 in, in, his, own, in his own label. Now, as I mentioned, Joe Meek was totally obsessed and 
and fascinated with the subject matter of UFOs, flying saucers. Because you got to remember, in the late 50s, there was a lot of flying saucer movies and a lot of UFO sightings at that time. So it's not a rarity of that of, of, of the of American, British, or world culture not focusing on UFOs. What Joe Meek did was, once they put the Telstar satellite up and Sputnik and all those rocket things, and there's talk of going to the moon, Joe Meek made, in his own mind, music for the moon. And Joe Meek fully believed that it's not, not only is it possible to visit the moon, but there is also life on the moon. So the whole album theme is basically music that you hear on the moon, when you're on the moon, and encountering moon, moon people, or moon men, or moon women, or moon, what gender moon people are, I don't know. So he actually had names for these people, and you know, he, I think there's like, there's the, um, the, the, the Dribcots. The Dribcots are moon people. They're like earthlings, but moon people are called the Dribcots. Or the Saros, that's another like uh, uh, a term for moon people. And this album is amazing. The Blue Men originally was a sort of like a pub rock country band in the late 50s uh, who had a, a Hawaiian steel guitar player in the, in the lineup, which was unusual at the time. Uh, as we know still, Hawaiian steel guitar, we know the sound because we heard Hawaiian music as well as country and western um, artists have used the steel guitar extensively. Here, Joe Meek uses steel guitar in a very different manner than you would hear in a country or a Hawaiian uh, music. And when I first heard this album, like 28 years ago, I bought this CD version of it, and again in Japan. Um, I thought it was like a novelty record, and it was in a sense because Meek tried to sell it as a stereo effect album, like this is a, this is a record you buy to test out your speakers, see if they work properly and you get the special effects. But also, that's one level, as a businessman, Meek tried to sell the record, but, but the real level was Meek saw this as a really, as a, um, it's his musical statement on the beauty and the thought, the fantasy, and the desire to go out of space to confront people from outer space. And he wrote music, he wrote, every, he wrote all the songs on the album. Um, on the behalf of, in his mind, this is what music is going to sound like in outer space. And this is not totally new. I mean, there's been exotica records in that time period, perhaps where they sort of did outer space music, especially uh, due to science fiction movies being made at that time. But Meek's take on it, which makes it unique, is that his is more personal. I think the others did it because of commercial reasons. But Joe Meek had a vision of actually going out of space and hearing this type of music. So what does this music sound like? Well, this is where Meek is at his most experimental. He, he not only had a band, which was like a guitar, vocals, the steel guitar, the percussion, bass, but totally compressed, like all his band music is compressed. It sounds like it's recorded like in another like dimension in a way. You're just sort of like hearing it for the telephone or some, you're not hearing it directly in your face. It's like a distance from you always. Uh, but what comes strong is all the sound effects, all the bleeps, all the neurops, all the, all the sort of, well, we, we think of synthesizer noise, but this is before synthesizers. So what Meek would do was basically, he would take the tape, he would speed it up, the sound, he would record sounds, he would speed it up, slow it down, do combination both, cut, edit, cut it, at, and then he would combine them together as well as recording like the toilet flushing. So he recorded the toilet flushing, but he'll do it like backwards, the sound, play it backwards, play it forwards, he'll slow it down or speed it up. Or he'll do things with a hair comb and maybe hitting the hair comb against the mic a certain way, like it makes a percussion sound. Meek had various techniques of making uh, his sounds and his noise. And listening to it now, like I just heard it this couple of days, uh, this last night, uh, it struck me, I've been listening to a lot of um, musique concrete from uh, France, 1950s. And parts of this record sounds totally like a Pierre Henry record of the 1950s, like total musique concrete. And musique concrete is basic electronic music but used in uh, acoustic sounds or, or, or uh, um, analog sounds. It could be sounds from the street, sounds of uh, percussion, sounds of hitting something against a wall or 
on a table and then magnifying that sound with, with, with miking and uh, tape loops and stuff like that. So there's great, there's great parts of the Joe Meek sound that's, that's very much is music concrete. And when I listen to it, I'm thinking like, wow, I'm not listening to some weird 1960, you know, 1959 or 1960 British hit maker. I'm listening to like Pierre Henry or, or, Pierre, or you know, one of the other uh, uh, music concrete composers. And then it's, it's pure music concrete in parts, but then the melody kicks in by Joe Meek. And by the way, Meek could not play any instrument, nor could he sing. He was famously out of tune when he sang or hum. So Joe Meek's technique of putting songs together was basically he would hum on a tape. Mm -hmm. Do I sound out of tune? Apparently Meek was way worse than me. And Meek would either do it on tape or with a composer, a music director in front of him. He would hum to the director to, for him to transcribe the music for the musicians. Now keep in mind that musician or the musical director's main job was not to laugh hysterically. If he laughed hysterically while Joe Meek was doing this, it's a good, more likely Joe Meek would totally flip out. Joe Meek had, had a low tolerance to approaching anger. And he, apparently he has a Dr. Hyde, a, a Hyde and Jekyll effect where he's either a very nice person or he's a monster. And being a monster is like laughing at him, singing out of tune. So whoever takes care of that for him, do for his life's sake, he had, a, he had to, he had to just totally ignore the out-of-tuneness of Joe Meek and just focus on his work. So Meek made this record, I Hear a New World, which is an incredible album. Very hard to find. You can find it on, on online and stuff, and it's quite expensive sometimes. But it is, you can hear it on Apple Music or Spotify. You, I believe it's on, on those formats. Uh, it's totally different when you hear it on a disc and a vinyl the way it should be because the sound is much more fuller. And I think if you heard it on a Spotify or you heard it streaming, I think it'll sound more novelty-like. This is something I, I, even on CD, it sounded like kind of like novelty piece. And when I heard the album, the, the sounds are so rich and so textured and it's like really beautiful. But not in a beautiful sense of beauty, but like, because Meek does use ugly sounds, like music concrete sounds. And it's a work of genius. It is a work of genius. And to compare Meek to anybody this day and age, I would compare him to Brian Eno. Specifically, Eno's Another Green World, and I'll tell you why. Meek's I Hear a New World is about outer space. Another Green World by Eno which I believe is his third solo album, which is very textured, and it has a very sort of environmental found sounds being mixed into the music. It sounds like an exotic jungle in South America or somewhere. When you hear the music, it's very much exotica, Eno style. And of course, Joe Meek's work is very exotica, about doing its outer space. So Joe Meek from 1960, and then Brian Eno's Another Green World was done in 1975. As far as I know, Eno has never acknowledged Joe Meek's work, because maybe he never heard it, I don't know. I find that hard to believe. But they're both very similar, because both Joe Meek, and this is a very important point, Joe Meek and Brian Eno are not technically musicians, but they use the recording studio as a musical instrument. Meek's studio is a musical instrument to him. Brian Eno's recording studio or wherever he's working at is a musical instrument to him. When he's working for other people, like for like David Bowie during the uh, Low and Heroes, although he technically, he does not produce those records, uh, Tony Visconti produced those albums, Eno still is not playing an instrument per se, but he's playing the whole studio as an instrument. And there have been other people like Les Paul who did the multi-tracking, so that sounds like a studio work, but, but Les Paul is a musician, a great guitar player. Joe Meek didn't play anything. He can't even write a song. I mean, he can write a song, but he can't he just hum. But he could play his musical studio as an instrument, and that's what he did with other you know, people in the studio. He played it all like a musical instrument, like Brian Eno did. And um, that's my theory.
personal theory about Eno and Joe Meek. But I really want to recommend this book I just purchased as well called Joe Meek's Bold Techniques. There's been other books on Joe Meek, one a biography that's pretty well, extremely well researched, but not as well written in my opinion, because the narrative of Joe Meek's life is quite amazing. But uh, this book covers not only the biography of Joe Meek, but also Joe Meek's equipment and the way his apartment was laid out for recording, and a great deal of information, technical information. The beauty of it is, um, as a person who knows nothing about hardware or equipment or recording techniques, it was still an enjoyable read for me because of Joe Meek's character and me knowing his music well enough to know, to appreciate how a certain microphone works against it, that environment or that setting. And uh, the writer, um, uh, Barry Cleveland did a magnificent job in not only focusing on, on Joe Meek's instrumentations, instruments he used or the band used, but also all the mics and the compressors and the recording de desk that Meek used in his home in Holloway, and also a, a mapping of how things were laid out in the Joe Meek apartment. But also, it's also a good biography. He covers and interviews quite a few people. Um, who knew Joe Meek throughout his life, and there's really good interviews in this book. And um, again, if you don't know Joe Meek, his life story is very tragic. Um, as I mentioned, he was a gay man in an age when homosexuality was outlawed, and so therefore he was forced to live underground of sorts. <laughs> but he didn't move that far away from Holloway Road, because again, he lived and worked in the studio on a consistent basis. But also, um, tragically, Joe Meek was schizophrenic. He was a very ill, sick man. As I mentioned, he had this sort of doctor, you know, he had this Jekyll and Hyde personality. And what happened was, uh, he, was he lived upstairs, his studio was upstairs from a leather shop, I believe. And the woman who ran the shop downstairs was also the landlord or landlady. And Joe Meek was in a stage of aggression and anger and probably under different types of medication and drugs he was taking at that time. And he either accidentally or on purpose shot his landlady dead. Which in turn, he turned the rifle onto himself and blew his head off and died, of course. It was actually Heinz's rifle <laughs> that he shot himself with. So that is the story of the sad end of Joe Meek. But as that narration is interesting, of course, in a, in a tragic way, and I think he's sort of the gateway of the whole gay world of London circa 1960s, again, when it was outlawed, the homosexuality acts or sexual acts. But as a sonic music, musician or, or a sonic architect, a uh, sonic composer, and I would say even an experimental composer, Joe Meek was like one of the best. It, it, and to this day, it's hard to know all of Joe Meek's records because his discography is still in, in a chaotic mess. But eventually all that will clear up. There will be a documentary coming out on Joe Meek very shortly, within a year or so, I imagine. And um, find, locate, study, read on Joe Meek. He's an amazing, amazing figure in 20th century music. And this is Tosh Berman, Tosh Talks, and I will be seeing you very shortly. Thank you very much.